I want to uh, jump into what it is I'm going to share with you today. For the last couple of times that I've spoke, um, I've actually talked about identity. And th uh, last, last time I spoke, I talked about identity that builds intimacy. And so we're going to continue on that today, but we're going to visit an, um, a completely different section of Scripture to kind of continue to build on that. So if you weren't here for, the, for any of the parts that I had done already, um, I'll give you just a couple of minutes to kind of revisit that. And essentially where we kind of started with this whole conversation was that your identity will drive your behavior, whether that's good or bad, it happens. Yeah. Who you believe yourself to be will determine how you carry yourself, how you act, how you talk, everything about everything you do. And it's all based in who you believe yourself to be. Um, you probably, uh, at some point, maybe you've seen um, a, a movie or maybe you've known somebody that had, they had a lot of money. And you're like, and they'd, maybe they didn't even know it, that they had a lot of money. Maybe it was something that, um, I'm thinking there was a, a Disney movie, and I forget the name of it now, but she was a princess from birth. She didn't even know it. She was just an average kid. Princess Diaries, there you go. Um, she didn't even know it. And later on in life, she discovers this is who she is, and there's a whole new world that's open to her. Um, and sometimes we kind of are that same way because when we are growing up, not always are we told the truth of our identity of who we are in Christ. Uh, a lot of times, especially what I grew up in, the churches that I grew up in, um, it was a lot of you have to do this and you have to do that. And if you do this thing over there, God's going to be angry with you. If you do this, God will be happy with you, whatever. And so what that ends up resulting is, is you're not always sure if God is happy to see you or not. Um, so during worship, you go to him and you're like, man, I hope you're in a good mood today, is kind of what that produces in you because you're not really sure if you're getting happy God or angry God today because maybe you sinned and you forgot or you didn't even realize you did it and he's mad at you but you don't even know it and then it just creates this schizophrenic craziness that exists in our Christianity and then it starts to really eat away at our own confidence and our own identity because we aren't really sure number one who dad is so we don't even know who we are so your your identity is, is so important in just understanding how to live life and how to go through life. And one of the things I talked about last time is it's important that in our process of walking our lives out with God and with each other that we don't get lethargic, that we don't get lazy, but we take time to have intimacy and we take time to... Um, to maybe we set aside time and maybe we have experience where we just get to know him better. Um, and so today, I want to take you to a section of scripture that I have taught out of several times. Pastor Cindy actually has brought it up the last couple of times that she has spoke. But the more that you kind of start to dig into things, I always love it when the Holy Spirit kind of opens a new avenue of something. You know a scripture and you've read it and you've studied it and you read it again and then all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, I never saw that before, right? So that's kind of what we're going to go to today. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And um, we're going to start in verse 18. We're going to kind of walk down through this. Um, I'm going to, I want to start off by telling you, I've been doing a little bit of reading in Paul's writings in, in a lot of, in this particular section of scripture. And a lot of times that we actually, will you do me a favor, back up to verse 17 for a minute? So I want to just show you something that's a little bit quirky on the way that Paul wrote these letters and the way that we would maybe understand them. So this is kind of a little just extra, you can throw this in your notes with little asterisks, this is just fun extra stuff. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Here's the way that I've always understood this and the way that I've always heard this preached, is therefore, if you are in Christ, this is who you are, but therefore, if you are not in Christ, then you are not this. So in other words, we read the word if as though it's a possibility that you are or you aren't, okay? But let me tell you, let me give it to you this way. If I am, let's, let's just say for the sake of the argument you helped me earlier, Ty and I are having a conversation and I'm explaining to her a process by which things happen, okay? And I'm saying, so this happens and then this happens and then once that happens, then this happens and this brings the conclusion 
So if all of those things are true, this is the result. It's not an if, maybe it's going to happen, maybe it's not. If you read all down through what Paul is saying, he's talking about this transition, this new covenant, and all of these transformations that happen on the inside of us. And he says, so therefore, if all of those things are true, which we know that they are, then you are in Christ. Then you are a new creation. So this is a little bit of a... Maybe that means something to you, maybe it doesn't. I'm just trying to help you with this a little bit because what he's saying is if anyone is in Christ doesn't mean maybe you are, maybe you aren't. It means everything I've said to this point is true and since it's true, or if that's true, then the remainder is true. That's what he's doing. Paul, as he wrote a lot of times, was making arguments of sorts or laying it out as a, as a lawyer would. As a lawyer would stand before a judge and say, so this and this and this and this, so if all of this is true, then that means this is true. That's what Paul's doing. Okay. Hopefully that helps you. Or maybe you're bored out of your mind already. Well, let's, keep, let's see what we can do. All right. Verse 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So I want you to see, there's a couple of things today, and I'm going to use an example here that I want you to see. I've used this before, but it's been a while since I've shown anybody, so we're going to, we're going to revisit this. But the first thing that I want you to notice about this, it's important that you understand that God was the one doing this reconciling, and you had nothing to do with it. Okay? So, he has... All things are of God who has reconciled us. This is already done. It's already finished. It's already established. It's already been done. And guess what role you played in it? Nothing whatsoever. So in other words, the reconciliation process that God went through for us didn't really involve us, but it was for us. We get the benefits of it, but we weren't actually the ones who had to do anything about it. So it's important to see that God made the first move and showed us how this reconciliation works. And he showed us his heart and his character by being the one to step out and to do this. See, if you believe that God's wrath was being appeased by putting Jesus on the cross, you can't believe this scripture. You have a problem here. Because if you believe it was God's wrath that put Jesus on the cross, then you can't really understand that what's happening here is the Father did everything with Jesus. Jesus and the Father did nothing apart or independent of one another. Jesus himself said it. The only things I say are what I hear the Father say. The only things I do are what I see him do. So you know what Jesus saw right before he went to the cross? He saw Father hanging on the cross. That's what he saw. That's, so that's what he did. And so the fact that he was in him working this through, uh, or through Jesus in front of us, it wasn't uh, anything that we did, but we get the benefits of it. So I want to give you, I want to show you this example, because it's been a long time since I've done this, but I want to, um, this, this can really help you. And if you've read um, Destined to Rain, it's a book by Joseph Prince, he gives this example, but I think it's worth revisiting. So I need a couple people to help me. So Danae, come on up here. You're going to be one of them. Who wants to be a sacrifice? Emily wants to be a sacrifice. Come here. All right, so it's not, it's not every day that we do examples, but so here's what we're going to do. Danae and my example is going to be a sinner, okay? So sinner, you go over there. All right, Emily and my example is going to be the sacrifice, okay? So this is, this is the best part. Neither one of them got the better end of this so far. We have a sinner and a sacrifice right now. So, but I want you to see, under the Old Covenant, just hang tight for a minute. Under the Old Covenant, this is how it worked. Is that when you sinned, you brought a sacrifice and presented it to the high priest, who then presented it to God on your behalf. Then you were justified based on that sacrifice, which is why you had to bring the spotless lamb. Right? You remember in the Old Covenant, it had to be perfect. Couldn't be with a blemish or problem or anything like that. It had to be a perfect one. So here's what ends up happening. Is Danae sins, and she has a problem of some kind, and so she needs to reconcile this with God, right? 
talking old covenant. This is all, this is what happened. She sinned and she has to reconcile this sin problem that she now has with God. So she comes over to her flock and she goes, I need a perfect sheep to die. Here's a perfect sheep to die. Okay, so here's her perfect sacrifice. She's picked one out, this spotless lamb right here. Okay? All right, honey, you want to be God for my, in my example? You, you come and be God. Huh? No, I don't, know. I don't need Jesus in this one. All right, Father, go stand over there for a minute. All right, so now we have a sinner. She's picked out her sacrifice. And so now what she has to do is she brings this sacrifice to the high priest. I'm going to be the high priest in this example. All right, so bring me your sheep that I'm going to destroy. So here's what happens. Old covenant, right? So here's the sinner. This is the one who did the sin, right? Don't walk away from me. Here's the sacrifice that's about to give its life for the sinner, right? Okay, so, yeah. Oh, sorry. She's like, I'm getting killed. Yeah. So here's what the high priest did. The high priest would examine the sacrifice and say, okay, this is a perfect sacrifice. Then, yeah, that's the dying part. You can stand up, though. Okay, kill the sacrifice. And so as a result of that, you just stand here for a minute, the dead sacrifice. The high priest then would go to God and say, I'm presenting you this one who is clean. So now this relationship can be reconciled because of that. Okay, does that, does that make sense? So I want you to see something in the middle of all of this. When the, when the sinner brought the sacrifice, do you notice the high priest never examined the sinner? Do you understand what I'm saying? rewind for a minute. Sinner brings the sacrifice. The high priest then examines the sacrifice. Not the sinner. She's over here. I'm not examining her. I'm examining the sacrifice, right? So I'm looking this over, and because the sacrifice is perfect and gives its life for the sinner, now this relationship is reconciled. Does that make sense? See, see, how, see how important this is and see how we get messed up because what we act like happens is when we sin, I'm the high priest now, which is Jesus in the new covenant, that, that we are being examined and God's saying, failure, 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 this, this is just a complete mess. But the sinner has nothing to do with it. It's about the sacrifice that was put in the sinner's place. Does this make sense? This is why the Bible says that Jesus is the lamb that was slain, but also the high priest. So Jesus is stepping into both roles, saying, I am the sacrifice, and because the Father said it over me, I am perfect. So the examination is complete, and the examination is perfect, so that this relationship can be reconciled without this one having to do anything. Does this make sense? All right, thanks, sacrifice, sinner. Thanks, God. (laughs) But this is so, so important to understand is that when when you understand this process that they went through, that the person was justified by the sacrifice, not that the person was justified because of what they did or what they earned. And see, when Jesus stepped in and said, I'll be the sacrifice once and for all, one time will I die, and it covers everybody for all time, what that did was justify you and me, and we weren't even involved. We, we're standing back and we're saying, but I am a failure, and God's like, I just examined the sacrifice and it was perfect. That's all I needed. This is good news. When, when the sacrifice steps in your place and it is perfect, You are justified as a result of what Jesus did for you, period. That's what this verse is talking about. That that God, who reconciled us to himself through the sacrifice, through Jesus Christ, because Jesus came and stood in our place, you now stand justified, period. So when we go before God and we say, I'm a mess. I, I just have all of these problems. He's looking at that statement going, what are you talking about? I've already made you to be the righteousness of God in Christ. 
It, that's, that's already done. I understand you're human, but human does not equal mess. Look, every single one of us are going to go through stuff. We're going to have good days and we're going to have bad days. And we're going to have three or four bad days in a row. And we're going to have a bad month or a bad year. That's, that's going to happen. I wish that wasn't the case, but that's the human experience. So we are going to have times where we feel like we're not good enough. But you never had to be good enough. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story that Jesus was good enough. So I want you to see, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus. So your reconciliation to the Father came through Jesus. You didn't have to do it. You just get to reap the benefit of it. And he has given us this ministry of reconciliation. So I want you to see, he gave us the responsibility or the service or the ministry to do the same reconciliation for people that he did for us. Now, we don't have to stand and thank God, we don't have to stand as a sacrifice for anybody because Jesus' sacrifice was good. It was enough, it covered everybody for all time. So we don't have to stand as a sacrifice, but somebody has to, had to come in and tell you and show you you've been justified. You've been justified by a sacrifice that was given on your behalf. So you stand faultless before God, not on your own merits, but because of the merits of the sacrifice. You are justified. Somebody has to tell you that. And so what he's saying is this ministry of what God did and what he showed us on the cross and even through all of the pictures in the Old Covenant of how forgiveness and how reconciliation worked, that's what we now are charged with doing. We're going to get into this a little bit more, but I'm going to, the word reconcile is not one we use a lot, except for when we're talking about a checkbook, typically. So, the, uh, I looked this up, the definition of reconcile, and this is just out of uh, Webster's Dictionary, is the act of causing two people or groups to become friendly again after an argument or disagreement. Remember in the book of Colossians how it says that we were once enemies in our minds to him? Not that we're actually enemies, but that we were enemies in our minds toward him. How, how do you get to the point of believing you're an, an enemy uh, or at odds with somebody? It's very easy to actually get to that point. When, how does a Republican think that the Democrat is an, is an enemy and vice versa? It's because you see things differently. Right? You have a different perspective. You have a different thought process on something. And so the, we, the Bible makes it incredibly clear throughout all the New Testament that our flesh is at enmity with God. It sees things differently. Not that your flesh is bad. Your flesh is necessary. If, you, if it wasn't here, then that's a problem, right? So it's not that your flesh is bad, but it sees things differently than how God sees them. In, in the Old Testament, we see that, where your thoughts are so much higher than my thoughts, your ways are so much higher than my ways. So we see this throughout Scripture, and what we're getting at, the point that we, I want you to see, is that as you go through this, your flesh does stand opposed to God. Why? Because it sees things differently. And so when we believe that we are at odds with him, that's where the disagreement comes in. That's where the, um, the break comes in. That's where this says that two people become friendly again, after an argument or a disagreement. It's not that we're necessarily arguing with God, although sometimes we probably are over certain things. That's probably true. But we have a disagreement with him when we walk in the, in the flesh, but he's trying to pull us into the spirit. Right? right? Not, not that flesh is bad, but it sees things a certain way, and it wants to experience things a certain way. And when it's depressed, it wants to stay depressed. When it's in misery, it wants to find somebody else who can be miserable with you. Right? That's the flesh, but the whole time the Holy Spirit's trying to pull you away from that. So there's this disagreement that's happening. There's this argument of sorts between our flesh and our spirit. And as the Holy Spirit continues to try to pull this out of us, this is the ministry that we've been called to. So for me or for you, looking at your friends, when you, when you say to somebody like, hey, look, you've got to pull yourself up out of this. It's not about you doing this, but man, what are you listening to? What are you putting in yourself? When's the last time you turned some worship music on? When's the last time you prayed? Why aren't you in church anymore? Why are we doing that? Because we're trying to pull you away from the disagreement of the flesh to see it like God does. 
right? Because that's the only way I can help you. I, I was thinking about this all throughout. I've been in doing ministry for long enough. My parents were youth pastors, obviously with Pastor Tim and Cindy. I, I've seen a lot over my lifetime. And the one thing that's always true is I, can, I only have one way to help you. There's only one, one thing I've got. That one tool might look different, but that one tool is Jesus. That's, that's what I have, but it's enough, and it works every single time if you'll use it. I, I can't make you use it, but that's, that's what I have to offer, right? Does that make sense? I, I can't force anything. Man, I wish I could. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I wish that I could. I wish that I could get it to the place where I'm like, this is exactly what you're going to do, because I'm telling you, if you do this, this will work, and it'll change your life. I wish I could do that, but it doesn't work that way. I only have one tool to give you, and it's Jesus, but it always works. It's always enough. My point is, what I can do is try to reconcile you to the Father. That's all I've got, but it works. It's enough. Let's keep going. Verse 19. This is the ministry that this is the ministry of reconciliation. This is it. We're defining it. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us this same word or service or message of reconciliation. This is the ministry that we've been called to. It's to communicate to others that fathers does not hold father does not hold your sins or your trespasses against you. Now I looked up the word trespass. That's another word that we don't use a lot except for in the woods. Um, <laughs> we, we just don't say it a lot. So I looked up the word trespasses, and in the original Greek, it's actually a compound word. So there's two portions of the word, and those two portions of the word actually have two different meanings. Um, so it's actually, if you were going to kind of literally put it into English as it reads in Greek, it would say, uh, not imputing their side slips against them. That's what it means. Okay, side slip, which is an interesting, that's why it's not written that way, because that doesn't mean anything to us, right? So, but what you look at, and what that means is there's two varying, not, not opposing, but two different, um, two different words or two different thoughts that go into this one word, okay? The first one is um, if you look at the word side, like I said, it's a side slip. The first one, side, actually means to willfully turn to the side. Okay, so you've made a choice to turn to the side. So let's just look at this one just for a minute. That God was in Christ reconciling the world himself, not imputing the moments when they decide to turn away from him, against them. That's the first part of the word. So the things that you're doing on purpose you know you're doing them, and you're still going to do them, guess what? Still not imputing it. Imputing means to, it's an, like an accounting term, like I'm keeping a, a, I'm keeping a ledger of it. That's what imputing means. So the second part means a slip, which is literally that. It's an error. It's a oops. So side slip, or trespass, as this is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their purposeful and accidental mistakes against them. That's what it means. It covers all of them. So this isn't about that God covered the sin nature. That's actually not at all what it's saying. What it's saying is the choices that you're making on a daily basis, that God is choosing not to impute them. He's choosing not to count them against you. See, we do that, and we're actually really good at it because we know how we failed, right? And so we're like, well, I didn't do this, and I didn't do this, and I shouldn't have done this. And we've got our list. We're good at imputing. We're good at accounting. We're all really good at it. Except for when you take your list to God and say, here's all my failures, and here's all this whatever. And he goes, I want you to take a look at that again. Kind of slides the paper back to you. You pick it up and look, and it's blank. That, that's what happens. That's what it is right? Because he's, he's not accounting them. He's not trying to find the errors and the ways to be angry with you. He's made the decision. See, God's justice made the decision that this applies to everybody all the time. Danae and I were just talking about this the other day about she was having a conversation 
in this youth group meeting at school that she went to about God's justice. And I was like, so what is justice to you? And she's like, well, I mean, I guess justice would mean that you kind of get what's coming to you. And I was like, well, that's the thing. God's justice is nobody gets what's coming to them. That's God's justice. That what, what I'm going to do applies to everybody all the time. That's God's justice. Right? And so here's the thing that I want you to, I'm just, this is a, Totally rhetorical question, but think about this. If, if we look at this verse and we understand what's going on here, that God was in Christ, so God was doing all of it with Jesus, reconciling or fixing this disagreement, fixing this argument between two parties, which the world here means cosmos. It means the entire thing, everybody, all of it. He's reconciled the whole world to himself, and he's choosing not to account for their, their accidental or purposeful mistakes. And he's committed to us this word of reconciliation. Where in the world did we get off thinking we have to preach about sin? When this verse literally says the exact opposite. I, man, I'm telling you. I preached this verse before, I never even really stopped to consider that all that much. This verse literally says, God was in Christ, fixing all of our problems, and not talking about, not considering, not thinking about sin. That is your message as well. And then all of a sudden we have everybody standing up in pulpits saying, you sinners! Maybe this isn't in every Bible. Maybe you should check in your Bible and make sure this verse is here. Maybe we just haven't seen it. Maybe we've never understood it. But if this is the word, if this is the ministry, if this is the message, if this is the service that we are supposed to have, is it any wonder that we're not talking about sin? We don't. But I know that if you understand that you are forgiven, you are made clean because of that sacrifice, Sin isn't a problem anyways. If you understand your identity in Christ, sin's not an issue anyhow. And I, I can tell you that for <clears throat> the first number of years of my life, it was about, Christianity was more about avoiding sin than anything else. Anybody identify with that? That, that was the, the majority of what I heard. Stay, stay clean, stay pure, stay holy, don't go by the world, don't touch that, don't do this, don't do that. Like, that's what I heard, okay? So Christianity became this understanding that for me to be a good Christian, it was more about avoiding things than anything else. That, I'm, I'm just telling you, that's how I understood it. Maybe you understood it differently. That's just how I understood it. Until this whole issue with grace comes in where I recognize that I am approved, I am justified, I am righteous because of what Jesus did, regardless of what I do or don't do. Now, I always want to stop here, and this is my caveat. I'm not saying that what you do or don't do doesn't matter. There are always consequences to the things that we do. Always. So don't think for a moment whether you're sitting here or listening online, don't think for a moment that I'm saying that what you do doesn't matter because it 100% does. And I can preach you that whole message and it would be longer than this one, okay? So I'm not saying that in any way, shape, or form, all right? So there's, there's my caveat on it. But what I'm saying is I stand justified before God, not because of me, but because of him, right? And that's my message to release to you, to release to the world, is that you have been reconciled to God. That this disagreement that you feel like you've had, maybe in your mind you've stood opposed to God, I'm telling you, you don't. Because he fixed that problem. He reconciled that issue. Right? It's a good spot for an amen. So whether you're doing things wrong on purpose, or you do them on accident, guess what? It's still covered here. He's still taking care of that. All right, let's keep going. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So in everything that I just said, if this is our message, then this should also be our plead. 
to people is to understand this reconciliation to God. Understand that you've been reconciled to him. That's, that's what I want you to understand. That's what we want the world to understand. That's Whether you've heard this message before or not, I want you to know I'm, I'm pleading with you to understand. I'm pleading with you to be reconciled to God. Now, everything that Paul just said, understand here, that even though God did it, there's a portion of it that we have to connect with. Okay? I don't have to do any part of the reconciliation, but I have to connect with it. I have to accept it. Right? And that takes renewing your mind. That takes somebody like me standing up in front of you and preaching a message like this, then you going home and reading through this section of Scripture again and say, all right, Holy Spirit, show me this. I've never seen this before. I want to understand this. This takes you every day of your life stepping a little bit closer to him and walking with him through life, and all of a sudden you go, you know, all this stuff that I used to have problems with, I'm not even thinking about it anymore. Like, yeah, that's exactly right, because that's what happens when you get reconciled to God. When your mind starts to be renewed to the truth of who you are and who he is, now all of a sudden life changes and it gets a lot better. I had somebody say to us uh, a little while ago about, um, about grace. Is, I'm totally on board with it, but it almost seems like you're, it's almost like it's fake because you, don't, you, you almost pretend like it's not, things aren't a big deal. I'm like, look. They, I'm not, it, once again, it's not about if it's a big deal or not. It's about how I can respond to it. I'm not being fake. If you bring a failure and set it in front of my feet, I'm not being fake by not judging you. I'm honestly not judging you because I know why it's there. But I have my own pile of stuff at my own feet. Does that make sense? It, it's not hard to not judge when I realize that I'm not being judged. Right? Right? That Jesus, Jesus talks about judging, but I'm not going to judge whatever is being presented to me because of the fact we could go back and forth and say, oh, you think that's bad? Here, I'll throw one at you. Like, oh, well, your stuff isn't as bad as my stuff. Who's to say what's worse? As far as the scripture says, if you screw up in one place, you screwed them all up. So anyways... It's important that we understand that we connect to, to this reconciliation. As much as you can understand that the sacrifice made you perfect, if you don't accept it and believe it and identify with that, it doesn't really mean anything, right? And, that's, and you'll have people who will stand up in front of you and say, I'm imploring you on Christ's behalf, please understand that there is no disagreement between you and God. Your, your sin does not separate you from him. He is not withholding himself from you. Like when we look at the story and we see that he passed by and Moses, such a holy man of God, and he only saw God's backside. Right? That's old covenant. That's not grace anymore. God's not hiding anything. He's not hiding our face. We look at the scripture and, that says, the God, you're so holy, you can't look on sin, not knowing that literally the next verse or the next line of that verse says, yet you do. Your sin does not separate you from God. It never has and it never will. So I am imploring you on Christ's behalf to understand that you've been reconciled to God, to understand the depth and the meaning of what that actually entails, that the sacrifice that was presented for you and on your behalf changed everything, literally everything about the most of the things that you probably heard. If God and sin were in the same sentence, you can probably forget most of it because that's not the issue anymore. The issue is your identity and who you believe yourself to be in Christ. That's the issue. And that's why we have Christians walking around believing that, we sh that all kinds of craziness, let me just say that, all kinds of crazy things because they still don't know who Father is yet. They don't know who they are. Verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Watch this. That we might become righteous, the righteousness of God in him. So we've gone through this whole process. We started in verse 17. And we said, therefore, you're a new creation in Christ. All the old has passed away. The new is now here. And then we look through that God has reconciled the world to himself. He's given us this ministry. That's what we are called to do. That we are to plead uh, for everyone on uh, to, to be reconciled to God, to accept this. And he says, because he made Jesus to step into this place of sin for us so that we could be this righteousness of God in him. So he ends this whole thing with this, a gigantic statement of identity. 
So where does this message of reconciliation take us? It takes us to your identity in Christ. It takes you to exactly who you are, an understanding of who you are in him. Again, because the sacrifice that was examined was Jesus and it was perfect. He was made to be sin so that we didn't have to be. We, Father examines the sacrifice, which is perfect, and says, that's exactly what I needed. It's over. There's no other part that needs to be done. Now that means that you're all justified. That's what it means. So where does this take us? It takes us to a place that we can start to understand who we are in him. And who we, who we are in him. Well, let me, let's look at this first of all. I've said for a lot of years that God is in the business of exchanging. You give him the best you've got, and he'll give you the best he's got. You always come out ahead on that exchange. You always do. Because sometimes your best isn't really very much. It may not be all that great. So I've told this story before. I'll tell the short version of it. It was Christmas time. We didn't have any money. Brittany's like, we should pray. I'm like, I have zero faith right now. I, actually, I might be running in the negative right now. I have zero faith for this right now. I have no desire to pray for this. She's like, well, we should pray and believe God for some money. I was like, whatever. Okay, um, God, we need money and stuff. And I don't know what we're going to do. And um, if you got some money, that'd be cool. It was about that pathetic, wasn't it? I mean, I'm maybe exaggerating this a little bit because I got the mic on, but it was pretty bad. And um, in Jesus' name, amen, I guess. And let's get ready to go into town because we're going to go shopping and spend our 50 bucks or whatever it is. And I get done praying, and I heard the Holy Spirit. It's like, hey, go look in your Tootsie Roll bank. I used to have, you know, the Tootsie Rolls that come in those little banks. And I used to have one of those in my office room. And if I had extra cash, I'd put it in there. Well, the problem is I didn't have any extra cash for a long time. That's why we had no Christmas money. And um, I was like, there's nothing in there. I'm not going to go look in there because there's nothing there. Well, my wife also heard the same thing. And instead of arguing, just went and did it, just went and looked. And I uh, hear from across the house, hey, honey, what's this? She comes out with this big old wad of cash in her hand. I'm like, where did that come from? I had the Tootsie Roll Bank. I'm like, of course it did. So now i now I'm actually a little angry at myself, but I was like, of course it did. I was like, how much is there? It was 400 bucks or something like that. I mean, it, it, was, it was a significant amount of money. Yeah. So I was, I'm, honestly, guys, I'm completely blown away because there was nothing in there. I know there was nothing in there because there was nothing in there. I wouldn't lose 400 bucks. If you don't know that I wouldn't lose 400 bucks, you don't know me very well. That's really not the way this works. So I'm not going to misplace that much money or just forget that it existed. I don't know how it got there. I don't know when it got there. I have no idea. But what I'm saying is sometimes we give God the best we've got, and it's pathetic. And yet he gives you the 400 bucks back just for fun. Because he's in the business of exchange. That's what he does. So he takes the very best you've got, which sometimes is just embarrassing. And he's like, that's okay, I got gotcha. you. See, I want you to look at this. In, in, let, let's keep going I, for the sake of time. Verse, verse, uh, no, we're in, we're in verse 21, yeah. All right, so God's in the business of exchanges, but I want you to see you've been made righteous in him, which means you're justified, you're holy, you're righteous, you're in agreement with him, and you're personally accepted by God. All of that stuff happened without you doing anything because he did the reconciling. And he was the sacrifice. So I want you to understand that you are his holy son or daughter, period. That's the end of the story. Your identity in Christ is this is who you are. You are loved from now until forever. And that's never going to change. God's never going to choose to walk away from you. He never will. That's not part of who he is. That's not in his DNA. God is of many, many things, and one of the things that he is is faithful. And when he says that everything that Jesus went through on the earth, all the stuff that happened, was to reconcile you to himself, that means that reconciliation happened now until forever, and he will remain faithful to it forever. I'm going to give you... Um, 
as we can, we're going to wrap up here in a little bit. But I want to show you and give you maybe a little bit more practical version of what this looks like. But I want to start with this thought before we go to the scripture. Um, it's in John 21 if you want to go there for me, JJ. But um, we can look throughout scripture and you can find people who failed significantly or failed in so many different ways. But you can see that God still used them in powerful and amazing ways. Well, how in the world can that be? Reconcile that for a minute with some of the stuff that you maybe were taught in the past. Because what you were taught in the past was what I went to earlier, how I said that God, sometimes he's happy and sometimes he's mad and sometimes this and sometimes it's everything's okay and I don't know if I'm really holy enough, I don't know if I'm righteous enough. But yet, you see throughout Scripture, uh, we're not going to go to this one, but why was Samson used so mightily when his life was a disaster? Everything that God told him to do, he did the opposite. Yeah. All of it. The entire time. So how in the world was it, how, how was he used so wonderfully to help set people free? How, does, how in the world does that even happen? He's a disaster. I'm going to show you another one in a minute. But they're, but they're all throughout Scripture. You can find where people completely mess up, and yet God still uses them somehow. Well, what in the world? I'll tell you this, and then we're going to look at the Scripture. I'm telling you it's because he's more interested in your heart and you knowing his heart than he is watching you navigate life without making any mistakes. He's okay if you fail. He's okay with that. He's not going to fall off the throne. He's okay. Because guess what? He kind of knows you. He kind of knows who you are. He kind of knows when there's going to be stuff that's really going to challenge you and things that, places where you're going to fail. He, he's, but he's okay with that. Not that he wants you to continue to fail, but when we do fail, he's okay with it. It's okay. It's all going to be okay. John chapter 21. Let's go, let's go look at this one for a minute. John chapter 21. And um, we're going to start at verse 3 and then jump down towards the end of the chapter after this. John chapter 21 and verse 3. Let me give you just a little bit of background on this. Many of you probably know it, but um, this is going to be the last thing we talk about today. Jesus, before he's going to be crucified, turns to Simon Peter and says, um, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, there's no way I'm doing that. No way. I am so in with you. I, my life is solid. Everything that I've done, my faith is unshakable. I'm exaggerating this, but this is the, this is the truth. It, I, I, am, I am on this. There's no way I'm going to fall. I, I've got this, Jesus. No way. No way could I ever mess this up. No way. I'm, I've got your back, man. Okay, this is Peter. Well, as we know the story happens, hey, aren't you with him? Pfft, I don't even know what you're talking about. Jesus, I, I don't know who that is. Wait a minute, I think I saw you with him. No, 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 it's my twin. He probably looks like me, but it's not me, right? And then a third time, hey, I know for a fact you're one of his disciples. And he's like, you beep. We have to edit that out for the sake of everything. But, and he just lets them have it. Like, this is, I have nothing to do with any of this stuff. And then the rooster crows and this guilt hits him like a ton of bricks. Because Jesus just told him, you're going to fail. And he's like, I am not going to fail. And he failed gloriously. He failed in front of everybody. Everybody saw it. And everybody heard it. And he is a complete and utter failure. Okay? That's the background. This is where we pick this up. Simon Peter said to them, so his, his buddies, his disciple buddies, I'm going fishing. You know, so... I love, I actually enjoy fishing, but that's not really a good translation. It's not about I'm going fishing. It's actually I'm going to return to the profession of fishing. That's what he's actually saying. He's not saying, you know what, I've had a rough day. Let's go fishing. That, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, I'm, uh, I've, I'm done with this. Jesus had died. I, I failed him. I am so overcome with guilt. You know what, I'm going back to my old life. Forget it. And they said to him, you know, that sounds good to us. We don't have anything better to do either, I guess. We'll go with you. They went out and immediately got into the boat. 
And that night, they caught nothing. Doesn't that just sum up all of human experience when we really start getting down on ourselves and we start getting depressed and we start uh, having ourselves a little pity party and we're like, this is what I'm going to do. And then that fails spectacularly as well. And we're like, man, nothing works right. Yeah, right. Because remember, your flesh sings things differently than God does. Yeah, anyways. Uh, jump down to verse 15. So let's get to the good part. So when they had eaten breakfast, this is after Jesus helps them catch fish. This is after they had eaten breakfast. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said, to this, said him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So I want you to maybe put yourself in this moment for a minute. That Jesus shows up on the, on the shore. Peter had returned to the profession of fishing he'd done. He'd quit. He'd failed so spectacularly that it literally overcame him with guilt, and he was done. So Jesus shows up and asks him this really amazing question. Peter, why aren't you in church? That's not what it's in my Bible, by the way. Shows up and asks him this amazing question. Peter, what the heck is wrong with you? Okay, let's try it again. So he shows up on the beach, and he asks Peter this amazing question. Peter, you are such a failure. What am I going to do with you? But how many times have you believed God has said exactly those things to you? I, I'm just, call it like I see it. It's how I do it. So they're on the beach. Peter had quit everything, told Jesus to get lost. I'm done with all of it. Jesus shows up and says to him one question. Peter, is our love Okay. I know it's not what it says, but you get it. Peter, is our love okay, me and you? Yes, Jesus, you know that I love you. Oh, Peter, I want you to understand. Is our love okay? Yes, our, my, our love is fine. I'm not sure you get, Peter, I want to make sure that our love is okay. Do you understand the difference? between the God that you probably were presented with at some point in your life and the God that's sitting on the beach with Peter right now? When we fail and when we come up short, because we're going to, when we fail spectacularly and everybody sees it, when we have made a decision in our heart that I'm just done with all of it, do you know what Jesus does? Comes to you and he's going to be like, I want you to remember that I love you, right? Is our love okay? Because that's the beginning and end of the story. That's, that is the story. Every time that he reaffirmed his love to him, Jesus then took a, just a, a minute to pull the potential out of him and to speak to who he actually was. Because every time he asked him, do you love me? He's like, yeah, I love you. And he said, then I have something I want you to do. You do know that Peter went on to have a huge effect in spreading the gospel all throughout Jerusalem. And even some of his writings and some of the influence went beyond that. But he went on to be incredibly influential. See, Peter knew what he was called to do, but he was so done and covered with guilt. He's just, I, I forget it. I'm not doing any of it anymore. I'm, I'm just done. And Jesus is like, is our love okay? He said, yeah, our love's okay. Then I have something for you to do. Remember who, who I called you to be. Remember who I made you to be. Don't forget what I placed on the inside of you because it's still valuable. I know you messed up, but I still want it to be pulled out of you. Don't hold it back. Do you, do you hear this conversation now that, that, that's actually happening? I know that we're getting just a snapshot of it, and I know I'm adding this in here, but these are the conversations within the conversations that are happening because of the, what's going on, the circumstances. Jesus is saying, I don't want you to forget 
I don't want you to, to lose sight of what I made you to be. Because what I made you to be, it's bigger than you even know. So I want you to continue to come. I want you to come back to this. But Peter, you know why I want you to come back to it? Because I love you. Because our love is okay. That's why. I want you to remember that I love you. I want you to remember this is how this whole thing works. So since Jesus was the perfect representation of the Father, we can look at this, these kinds of scriptures and we can come to the conclusion that in our deepest failures and disappointments, that he is there to love us right back to where we belong. If any part of you still pictures God with a whip or a hammer or a lightning bolt or the leather belt or the wooden spoon or whatever it is that you connect with punishment, if any part of you still identifies with that, that part of you needs to be reconciled back to his heart. He's already shown us and he's presented it, but sometimes you need somebody like me to get up and, and show you. And that's not a bad thing. We all need that. I need people to remind me. I need people to help me. I, I need other voices in my life to say, you know the things that you've thought you knew all this time? Let me show you something maybe a little bit different. I need that. You need that. We all need that. But when we look at especially sections of Scripture like this, this is what we see. That God's not going to drag you back where you belong, but he's going to love you back to that spot. All right. I'm going to wrap this up. That was it. If we're called to the ministry of reconciliation, which according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that's exactly what we're called to, then our primary focus should be to do exactly that. Because not only does that ministry of reconciliation reveal to us who the Father is, it reveals to us who we are. Last, my last thought, you can come to the, you can come up. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 that we are his special people. I, lo- I don't, as you've heard me say before, I don't like to get a microphone on, stand up in front of everybody and say, you guys are so special. Because that's not always understood like I mean it to be understood. Um, That word special there actually means something rare, valuable, and worth the price paid. So when God says that you're special, which actually isn't a bad translation, we just don't use the word that way all the time, but it's really what he's wanting you to understand that you personally are rare, that you personally are valuable and that you personally were worth the price that was paid to get you, which was what? The blood of his son. It's a pretty big price. It's a pretty big price, but you were worth it. See, that's Father's heart. And that's what I want you to see, and that's what I want you to understand. Because if you will understand that, As I said last time I spoke, you can't really grasp your identity until you grasp his. You got to know who he is so you can know what kind of DNA you've got. So as I normally say, I hope that as we talk through all of this stuff, I hope that this helps you because I hope that it helps to maybe redefine and readjust the way that you see God and the way you see yourself. That's why in the book of Hebrews chapter four, you go boldly to the throne. You don't go boldly to the throne if you're perfect. We already dealt with the perfect thing. Jesus was perfect, that opened the door. You don't go if you're perfect, you just go, right? So I could keep going and going and going on this. This is something that is really in my heart a lot lately. Things that have just kind of been rolling over and rolling over and I almost seem like I can't get away from it. Not that I want to, but in the sense that I believe this is a message that literally is transformational if you can catch it, if you can grab it. And how does faith come? By hearing it over and over and over and over and over again. So, if this is something you can identify with, go to YouTube, listen to it over and over again. Maybe my voice is annoying to you, but I've been told I have a voice for radio, so maybe it's true. 
Maybe it's not that bad. Or was it a face for radio? One of the two, I don't remember. I just said it before, you could say it, that's all. Yeah. All right. Anyways, Father, thank you today for your heart for us. Thank you that you are good. Thank you that you love us, especially in the places and the moments that we fail. Because, so, Father, sometimes we do it spectacularly. Sometimes we do it in front of everybody, and, and everybody sees it. And it's embarrassing, and we're, we feel guilty about it. Father, sometimes it's just we accidentally slip up, and it didn't go according to plan. But whatever that whatever the trespass, whatever the mistake looks like, whether it's on purpose or whether it's on accident, I thank you you've already chosen and already created the pathway to say we're forgiven, we're justified, we stand before you pure, clean, and holy because of the sacrifice. Jesus, you hung on the cross, that you brought the, the way, you brought the avenue, you created that avenue of reconciliation. Father, I thank you that you have reconciled me to your heart. Now help me to grasp that. that our, let that be our prayer today. Father, help me to grasp the reality of that, the understanding of that. Help that to be real to me like it has never been before. Father, I thank you today and I bless your name today because I thank you that the more I get to know you, the more I get to understand who I am. And Father, I thank you today that through this process, you're gonna help every single one of us redefine the places that need to be redefined. Father, I thank you for it. I thank you for your goodness and I thank you for your faithfulness. We bless you today. And Father, I thank you for your people I thank you, Father, that no matter where they're at, that they can stand in full confidence of your love for them. Father, I call them blessed. I thank you that they walk in your grace and in your favor every single day. Father, there's doors that are open to them, opportunities that you present to them, that, Father, there's nothing that would get even in their mind that would separate you and them. But instead, Father, I thank you that every single day you're helping us to walk in the fullness of your spirit, in the fullness of your love. Father, we thank you for it, in Jesus' name.